Hello and welcome to Fidelity Live, the Fidelity Asia Fund version. I'm Gary Monaghan, Investment Director for the Asia Pacific X Japan Equities. And today I'm going to run through a few slides uh, talking about the fund uh, in terms of what we're looking for and how we're managing your money, what to expect. And we're going to spend the bulk of our time on, on the stocks that are in the fund and what really we believe will drive alpha going forward. So what is the fund about? Well, we're trying to beat the benchmark, the Asia X Japan benchmark, and we do this in a very concentrated manner of 20 to 35 stocks. It's a high active money approach. Now, the key thing here is that the concentration doesn't mean more risk. And we can demonstrate that over time, the total risk of the portfolio has been similar, if not lower than that of the market. And that's really a function of the, the portfolio construction and risk management techniques that we impose. Uh, such as correlations and looking at intrastock stock correlations, understanding the volatility of the individual stocks and, and position sizing accordingly. And finally, there is no deliberate style of portfolio management that we, that we put into this portfolio. We're not trying to be growth managers. We're not trying to be a value manager or anything in between. We go where we think the best ideas are. Ultimately, we're trying to make money anytime, any place, anywhere. And once we've identified ideas that we think can make money for our clients we we like to put them the capital to work and so we want each position to have a meaningful contribution to performance very quickly on the process the the bulk of the ideas come from our research team we've got 45 asia x japan analysts across the region uh, based on the ground and they uncover a lot of stones and they, and they do a lot of the groundwork in, in, in that regard um, on top of that, we put the framework, the investment process framework over the top, and we're looking obviously at fundamentals, but also sentiment and passion. So, so what, what is this? What is, what is the market telling us? You know, what is the company telling us? Do we differentiate it? And, and, and let's go and value that. But the, cri the critical point here is that we have to think differently to the market. If we think the same, we don't really have necessarily an edge. So we look to move on. And, and as I mentioned just now, portfolio construction is a very important part of the process as well. And so we're always looking at correlations and volatility, liquidity uh, and such when we're, when we're constructing the portfolio to, just to ensure that it's a properly risk managed approach. Just a, a, a quick overview of, of what to expect. As I said, it's a concentrated portfolio and we, 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 we typically operate in a 20 to 35 stock band. We, we did spend a couple of months below that uh, the latter half of last year. It was basically a function of we had some sell orders on the desk, we had some buy orders on the desk and the, and the market hadn't quite fallen to a point where we thought the buy orders were ready to be, uh, ready to be put on. That did happen, um, but what you can also see in the sort of Q1 last year, we did see a big spike up in terms of number of stocks that we owned. And as you can imagine, as the market has fallen and there's a lot of interesting ideas out there at decent valuations, we were big buyers into that market. But despite the number of names, you'll see that the active money has been roughly around 90% over, over the history of the time we've managed to manage strategy. And also, just as I mentioned earlier, total risk of the portfolio has been similar, if not lower than that on the bench benchmark over time. So that is really a function of the portfolio construction uh, approach that we take. Now, this is a highly concentrated stock picking portfolio, and we need and we want to see bottom up stock picking do the work in terms of alpha generation. And you can see on the left hand chart that we've, we've handsomely um, outperformed the the benchmark over time and you can see that on the blue line in terms of active at active performance and stock specifics the orange line have been the key contributor to that uh, and that is what we expect and that is what we expect going forwards on the right hand side is a chart that we really do look at and we like it's the upside downside capture ratio and it, and it also it really follows what we would expect the performance profile of the of the portfolio to be now, we do expect to participate somewhat in, in up, upward markets, but we're, we're, you know, we're not chasing market markets. We're, we're not momentum investors. Um, so you wouldn't expect necessarily to always see shoot the lights out in, in, in a rising market. But more importantly, you see on the downside that we are able to protect capital somewhat when the markets are falling. Uh, and that, that is a function of the, the stocks that we pick. We believe that there's a margin of safety behind them. We believe they're solid businesses, often underappreciated. And again, it goes back to that, the, the, the portfolio construction and making sure we've got a, a risk managed portfolio that 
that really helps us weather stormy stormy days uh, uh, that we see from time to time in the market. And, and page seven here, you can see the performance, and this is an outcome of the process, and we've been able to, to deliver decent alpha uh, on an annualized basis over, over multiple years. So let's get into the nuts and bolts of, of what we're here to talk about, and that's the stops that we have and, and trying to somewhat bring this investment process to life. Now, Hangzhou Hype Vision is the biggest stock in the fund as we sit here today. It's close to 10%. Uh, these guys do uh, optic technology, so in camera optics, uh, things like robotics, uh, surveillance cameras, facial recognition, all, all of those types of things, which is an increasingly uh, important part of the technology world. If you want to have a robot to go off and do some automation in your factory, it, it basically needs eyes to see where it's going and, and to, to collate data. Um, if, if, you're a, uh, if you're a hotel or if you're an airport, you're trying to become more efficient, you want to do facial, uh, facial check-in. Um, even banks, they talk about doing ATMs where rather than putting in your PIN code, take looks at your face and you can start getting your money out or whatever it is you need to do. So facial technology and facial recognition and camera technology is, is, is really interesting um, and it's quite a critical part of, of the future growth of the technology world. Now, this is a stock um, that is Chinese and it's uh, also a stock that is at the forefront and, and the, I would say the crosshairs of the US-China trade conflict. This is a company that, that Donald Trump, when he started to have his anti-Chinese rhetoric, it was one of the companies he identified as, uh, as potentially being on, on the entity list. And so there were lots of rumors going around towards the back end of uh, sort of 2018 that, that, that this would be a company that would be added alongside the likes of Huawei. And the, the market sort of shook that off in the first quarter of last year. You know, we were really interested in the stock because we like that long runway for growth in terms of the, 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 the area that they operate in, but also the, the excellent technology that they bring to the table in this space. Now, as, as those rumors gathered pace that the entity list was coming into force, you can see that the stock price sort of fell in the first half of last year. <clears throat> and, and we were buyers into that. We, we started to buy into the stock uh, around June 2019 because basically we felt that whilst everyone was concerned about the, the, the entity list um, stock being added to the entity list and the negative sentiment that that would create, we, it, there became a bit of a misalignment between sentiment valuation and the actual fundamentals of the business. You know, this is a Chinese stock. The, the runway for growth is in China. The domestic growth story in China around all of this technology is vast. And, and what the market was doing was derating the stock um, and, and essentially saying there was no international growth that was going to happen for this firm uh, and pretty subdued, if, if any, growth domestically as well. That was a misalignment because, in our view, the, the the policy support that they got, the, the leading technology that they have, meant that there was significant growth within China, um, but also there would be international growth as well. Yes, the US was off the cards, but that was really a single digit revenue generator for the business. Um, a lot of their potential international growth would be in areas of emerging markets, um, they had some big deals in South America, for example, um, and so you were also effectively getting some of that for free. So we felt that there was some interesting uh, misalignment between sentiment and valuation and the true fundamentals of the business. Um, the, the day that the stock was added to the entity list, we, were, we, we increased our position further, and that was around sort of July into August 2019. And, and we were getting some validation, actually, of our fundamental thesis as the stock was, was going up. Um, subsequently, we, our, our, our view hasn't deviated, um, and it's still fairly negative sentiment towards the stock, just given where it sits uh, in the technology space and it always being in the, let's say on, on the radar for uh, for the US and um, but every time there's a bit of a wobble in the stock price or there's relative underperformance you know we have been there trying to top up the position because again we don't think that this long runway for growth is, is derailed for them. Um, we saw the derating of the stock post COVID I mean everything in the China market got sold off and again we were topping up our position because we just felt it was a, 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 a relatively short-term blip uh, in, in the story and, and it was really falling in, in, in sen the sentiment was falling because of the whole COVID uh, world that we were facing. And, and, and we've seen a, a nice pop-up in the stock since and we've been sort of riding that wave uh, as, as we go forward. An interesting 
sort of part here in this story and it's really a, a demonstration of the entrepreneurial spirit or the animal spirits that Chinese firms have. Now one of their one of the products that they were developing uh, was, was for the fire brigade. So you get a camera, you, you point uh, the camera to, to the fire and there's thermal imagery technology would, would indicate to the fire brigade effectively what was behind the fire. Um, and extremely high tech, very complicated. And, and in a post COVID world, suddenly if you're entering buildings, whether it's an office block, a shopping mall or school, temperature checks are, are required. And they've, they've effectively adapted that technology that they'd had for their fire brigade uh, cameras um, and to, to have temperature check cameras. So you now walk into a, in an office, so for example, at the office I'm working in Hong Kong, you walk in, Hangzhou height vision cameras pointed um, at everyone who's walking in, and it will basically beep if, you, if you've got a high temperature or not. And, and that is a huge uh, growth driver, it's an unintended consequence of, of the situation we're in, uh, but it's a huge potential growth driver for, the, for, you know, for another revenue stream for the business. And I think that really gives you a good demonstration as well of, of, of a Chinese company um, having that entrepreneurial um, approach, the, that animal spirit uh, to adapt and change and, and to the times in order to, to, to move on forwards. And the final point is just make a note of the, the, the PE and ROE here, because I'll get back to that a bit later. Now TSMC is another stock that, that we've held uh, in, in, a, in, in a big way, and it, it's our second largest position as we, as we sit here today, um, just behind Hangzhou Height Vision. And this is, I think, a, a, an interesting case study um, to, to talk about in terms of how we think. Now it's been a big position I mean, since we've been managing this strategy, but we've been adding to that significantly over the last few years to the point where it's been a top three position um, for, for quite a few years. Um, these guys, they're a foundry business. So basically uh, they call themselves the foundry of the world. So if, you've got a, if you're a technology company, you need a microchip um, built for your, for your product, whether it's a smartphone, an electric vehicle, or, or whatever else that's related to high powered computing and AI, all of these things, um, the chances are you'll be looking to TSMC as a partner to, to produce that chip for you. They're so ultra high tech, they're extremely efficient, huge uh, economies of scale, uh, and, and they're just the best in the business. Um, <clears throat> now, a little, slightly technical here, but in the, in the microchip space, you have a thing called nanomodes. So as you go down the nanomodes, it's basically a smaller chip with, with extremely high power that, that doesn't drain the battery. And, and you know, if, the, if you're going out into the marketplace, a lot of companies are struggling to do you know, 10 nanomodes and 12 nanomodes. TSMC are, are already starting to think about two or three nanomodes. So they are streets ahead of, of competition in general. So that's been a sound business for us. It's been a nice, a, a nice contributor to performance over time. But, but I will say that as we were sort of entering this year, we just started to feel that that the story had largely was, was largely playing out. It was well known. The valuations were, were okay. Um, and it was it was effectively losing you know, we were losing a bit of conviction in it not necessarily in the business but just felt the risk reward there was better opportunities elsewhere now two things happened obviously covid stock price fell like everything else we used that as an opportunity to top up um, and then in the in the post uh, sort of eight, march bottom bounce the valuations are getting back to the levels we that we saw previously and we had sell orders on the desk now this this stock had uh, by around um, sort of beginning of July, the second week of July, we were actually sat in, a, in an underweight position with some sell orders on the desk, effectively looking for, um, for an exit. And then something happened which basically changed our mind overnight. Intel, the, the US technology giant, um, they basically were, were, uh, were looking to deliver a whole bunch of processing orders to, to their client base. Now, as part of this, they needed to produce, uh, they needed seven nanomo chips for their, for their processors, and they were looking to produce the seven nanomo chips themselves. And so this is a, obviously a very well known, very well respected um, and high tech US company. The third week of July, Intel went to the market and said, guys, we're, we're probably going to be delayed in our delivery of these processors. We're really struggling with the seven nanomo chip. And I'm paraphrasing, of course. Um, and what that ha what happened there and then 
is it, mo it demonstrated to us a few things. One is this is a difficult business. And if Intel is struggling to, to compete, um, you know, what is everyone else, how, how is everyone else faring and it's pretty poor. And it really gave us some validation that this, that TSMC really is the best in the business. The second thing that it did is it meant that there was a future competitor in Intel down the road um, and they turned around and admitted they couldn't compete. And they were still quite a few years away from even getting, uh, playing, I wouldn't even say catch up, um, e even getting to where TSMC were a few years ago. Uh, and, and so that again sat, said to us that TSMC are streets ahead, but more importantly, the industry structure um, was, was truly a duopoly. So Samsung is the other main player in this space. And, and there was a bit of a, I suppose, a niggling doubt in our mind that the, 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 the potential onset of the likes of Intel could make this a bit more of a, uh, maybe a high, more highly competitive industry than, 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 than what it was in the past. Intel's announcement took a lot of that fear away for us. And suddenly this, the industry structure changed significantly. Uh, and not only that, Intel um, to, to deliver on their processing orders and, and admitting they can't do the chip will have to outsource the chip manufacturing. So they, they effectively moved from a potential competitor to a potential customer down the line. I mean, what, what a position to be in the TSMC. We used that as a opportunity to buy. As soon as we heard that, those sell orders moved to buy orders. We bought around 550, around that 550 basis points around that level in on that day. And so we moved from a potential underweight and out of the portfolio to a significant position to, to being a top two holding in the portfolio. Um, where, where we still think there's a lot of juice in the stock is of course that the business that they've got and the, and the demand for chips for high powered computing. Um, but, but we also think that the market hasn't quite digested that Intel news yet. And so we have, we have a much more positive view as we sit here today over the next two, three years than the general market does. Final point, again, like on the previous page, look at the PE and look at the ROE, because this is very relevant for this slide. So what I've spoken about with, with Hike Vision and TSMC is te our technology companies and really more sort of the tangible hardware or semiconductor industry, which, which we, we, we do kind of like at the moment. But what's been making all the noise in what is regarded as technology is around internet and e-commerce platform businesses. We do not invest in this area. Um, we just do not feel that there is the risk reward is attractive. If the risk reward was attractive, we would invest here. Um, but as it stands, as it stands today, we just do not think that that, that that it stacks up, particularly when you're looking at elsewhere in the marketplace. Now, I, I said to you in the previous slides, look at the PEs and the ROEs. Now compare them to these. All of these stocks trade at a much higher PE. Um, they have lower ROEs and you know, they have just been a, it almost feels like a, a one way direction. Um, when you're paying such multiples for, for businesses, you need to have a view that there is very few, if any risks uh, on, uh, uh, on the road ahead for the next two or three years. And, and to sit here and think that the, the e-commerce and, and social media platforms do not face very many risks or, or any risks at all for the next two or three years is probably very wide of the mark. And we're not prepared to pay up um, for, for, such a, for such a company. Now let's just think about, uh, let's say Alibaba and Tencent, which are the dominant players, Ali in e-commerce, Tencent in social media in, within China. What, what are the potential risks ahead? Well, actually there's, there's something that's come to fruition in the last sort of a year and a half or so, and it's a, a company called ByteDance, and it's a really good sort of tangible example of, of the competition that can come from nothing. So ByteDance is the company that owns TikTok, and uh, in, in China, it's called Daoyin. And at the end of last year, they actually announced that they just reached 1 billion monthly active users of their Daoyin app uh, in, within China. Um, so that put them in a very exclusive club. But if I was talking to you four years ago, they, they just weren't even they weren't around. Right? So suddenly, in the space of a couple of years, you've had a company that's gone from zero to a billion monthly active users within China. And of course, they've, they've got hundreds of millions of more users on TikTok globally. And, and they've come from nowhere. What is the chance that there is another type of company like that in whether it's e-commerce or social media platform that, 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 that appears in two or three years time and, and starts to eat into their lunch? 
there's a good chance. And, and bike dance is a really good example here because if uh, at the beginning of this year it was it was seen that the on in terms of mo online uh, advertising revenues, bike dance overtook Tencent in terms of uh, in, to to be the number two online platform in terms of advertising revenues. Right, so this basically came out of nowhere, and and they're eating into the market share of or of Tencent in particular. Um, so, so there is risks ahead in terms of competition, and, and it's obviously with, with cheap data and high-powered computing and the ease of getting such things, the, the risk of, of competition coming through just increases over time. Um, what else do we, do we, are we concerned about with some of these companies? And I'm going to particularly pick on Ali and Tencent here again. Um, they are effectively conglomerates. Right, so if, if you're looking at Ali, they've got the cloud business, they've got the payments business, they're, they're looking to compete with, with Meituan in, in delivery through an, a, a company they own called Elama, and then of course they've got the e-commerce business. There are a few other things around as well, but they're the, the, they're the main ones. You look at Tencent, it's, it's mobile games, it's the social media platform called WeChat, they've got their own payments business, so there's lots of businesses there as well. They're conglomerates, but who, who out there applies a conglomerate discount to these companies? And I would say absolutely no one. Um, and that's because they're in tech, in tech and it's kind of a sexy area and it you know, gets the headlines. And so it's easy not to do that. But if I was sat here and I was to talk to you about West Farmers or something like that, you'd expect us to put a conglomerate discount on such companies. Uh, and so we think that just because they are you know, maybe a bit more sort of new age technology, um, that you should still be applying such rules to such companies. And so again, the valuation doesn't quite stack up. Um, so overall, we're, we're a little bit hesitant in, in this space. And, and, and ultimately, sentiment has been uh, very hyped. Uh, and everyone is extremely excited and probably, in our minds, a little bit too short term in their thinking overall. Not to say they're bad businesses, um, you know, they, they do have opportunities. There are obviously some structural growth opportunities in e-commerce and, you know, and just the use of mobile technology. Um, but, but there are a lot of, uh, a lot of issues uh, in our minds ahead. So one final one, which I'll touch upon, um, is also around device change. I mean, everything that all of these companies do is, 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 is built around the smartphones. Now, what happens if in two or three years' time we start to shift technologies into wearables, or digital assistants like your Alexa, and you know, you know how, how are these companies adopting, uh, adapting their business models? And it's not very clear to us that, that there is a clear strategy there either. <clears throat> so whilst in the technology space, we're, we're, we're quite interested in some of the stocks that are in the maybe the, the technology sort of hardware and semiconductor space, um, it's a pretty different story for us when it comes to the, the, the software, e-commerce, internet type space. So where else are we, have, we, have we been looking? Um, one of the areas that we added to quite heavily um, in, in March this year was, was, was around the uh, travel sector. I mean, obviously, de got derated massively, negative sentiment because borders were shut, no one was traveling, uh, and, and it was terrible for tourism, hotels, and all of these areas. That was very interesting to us because suddenly n n market sentiment was extremely negative the D rating came through, so valuations are getting more attractive. And then when you're looking at the businesses, you say, yes, they're going to have a pretty tough 2020 and maybe for a period in 2021, but things will bounce back. People will travel again. People, borders will open again. Um, you know, let, let, let's start buying into these. And, and we did. And um, we bought trip.com, which is uh, China's largest online travel agency. Um, they've got around a 65, 66% market share in that space. Um, and, and what, what's quite interesting for us is that the, the way the market initially looked at, at, at the travel industry was that there's just going to be no travel whatsoever. Uh, and maybe they initially missed that within China, it's a big place, there's a lot of people, um, and domestic tourism will come back sooner um, and, and, and way before international travel. And we're actually starting to see that. So in, in the data that we look at and sort of high frequency data indicators that we look at, uh, indicate to us that domestic travel is back to around 80 maybe even 90 percent of the levels that we were at one year ago so so whilst people aren't going into china and chinese aren't necessarily leaving china um chinese tourists those 1.4 billion people 
are traveling around and they are touring around and they're doing business uh, within China. And, and to give you an anecdotal example, our analysts in Shanghai are meeting companies face to face, for example, and they're going off and meeting companies within China. And so a lot of Trip.com's business is around domestic travel, whether it's hotels, railway bookings, airplane bookings. So they are getting money through the front door. And then the, the, the next leg of, of, of the sort of potential upside for the company will be as the borders open and we start to see international travel return. <clears throat> Another one that we bought into is, is a company called Galaxy. So Galaxy are a casino operator and they, they are one of the, the, the key operators on the Macau Strip. Um, when COVID hit and Macau shut its borders, one of the first things we looked at <clears throat> was, was, was around how the casino operators would, would survive. Um, because basically they live and die by foot traffic and people gambling on the tables and spending money in the restaurants and such. And of course the stock got derated. Um, there was no clear indication when the borders were open. And so there was a lot of negative sentiment again around this, uh, around the whole casino operators. After doing some uh, analysis of the, of, the, of the balance sheets, we felt that even if there was nobody walking through the front door of the Galaxy properties, um, for around eight, around 20 months or so, they would still survive. They had a huge cash, uh, a huge amount of cash on their balance sheet, uh, and that was helped as well somewhat by the fact that the that they, alongside some of the other casino operators, were deferring their dividend, and so they were they were basically storing their cash and using it rather than paying off you know, investors' dividends, storing it for a rainy day and deferring that dividend at the future point. We 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 thought that was a smart decision. Um, and we used the, the, the derating of the stock to, to basically buy quite heavily into the, into the portfolio, around 3% position. As the market got a bit more buoyed and the stock did well, we sort of ridden that wave up. We have trimmed that position a bit into, into the strength, um, but it's still a, a, a position for us around today, around 3.5% or so. Um, we think there's still a bit of juice to go in, in, in the stock. Um, and, you know, when... At the casino, sorry, the Macau borders are slowly opening up and, and people are coming back. So uh, when, when they are fully up and running, business as usual, and um, we should see some nice uh, uh, gross gaming revenue uh, for, for the casino operators. Now, just a, a, a part of this Galaxy story, which I think is quite interesting and you know, something that's at the front, at the forefront of investors' minds, and something we get asked about by clients non-stop, is around the U.S.-China trade conflict, and, and how will companies, you know, how how are they face and fare in in a in a world of heightened tensions between the U.S. and China? Now, I talked a bit earlier about Hangzhou Hike Vision, in that yes, they were put on the entity list, but the U.S. wasn't part of their really part of their business. It was a domestic story, and we felt the market had missed that. Um, I'm going to give you another example a bit later, but here's an interesting one, I think, with, with regards to this US-China conflict. The question that we always get is quite one way. It's, well, what happens when the US puts tariffs on Chinese products? What happens when the US bans this? What happens when they put this company on the entity list? And it, it's that very much that, I suppose, the, the questioning from the US side and about how will Chinese companies fare. Macau could be uh, a quite an interesting battleground and, and where China if you like, could fight back in this, in this cold war, this economic cold war. The, the casino operators in Macau, there are six main casino operators. You've got SJM and Galaxy, which are the locally managed and locally owned businesses. You've got the Melco Group, which obviously from the Melco uh, company you guys will know very well, but, but does have some uh, local, local management there. Then you've got the Sands China Group, you've got uh, Win Macau and MGM. Their parent companies are the U.S. Uh, are, are in the U.S. and the Las Vegas casino operators in the U.S. If you want to fight back, you can start to hit these companies, for example. And, and we've got the licensing renewal negotiations coming up in 2022. So this will become actually a 2021 story. <clears throat> and and what you could see if things if things sour further from here is that this could be a battle, battleground that that. China, if you like, kind of fights back. And, and it could well be that the Macau, the, the, the Macau authorities um, make it more difficult for the, the US owned operators to, to get their licenses renewed, or maybe they get on less favorable terms than they've had in the past, 
whether it's less tables or, or, or things like that. And, and you would expect the local guys like Galaxy to, to benefit somewhat as well. Uh, on, on the back of, of maybe the, the the suffering that the US um, owned operators will, will will face. So so with that, although it's not a part of a key part of the thesis, it's something to keep in mind, and it will be increasingly moving forwards to the front of mind as, as we approach 2022. But I think Galaxy is is an interesting, or the, the Macau Casino operators is a very interesting sort of case study for for potentially how China can fight back going forwards. And it's potentially one of the reasons why we've seen a divergence in, in performance of Galaxy versus SANS um, since, since lockdown um, it, it sort of happened at the end of March. Now, again, it's not the key reason why we bought Galaxy over SANS, but it's certainly something of interest. And it's certainly something we think people should keep in mind. <clears throat> now, sticking with this part of that part of the world, so we've got China, uh, Macau, and, and, and here in Hong Kong. Now, Hong Kong is an area that we've been overweight uh, for some time. It's, it's still our biggest overweight position. And I, I would actually, uh, what I would actually say about this is that don't think about it, about it in terms of the, the listing. Um, think about it around the economic exposure. Um, a lot of Hong Kong businesses are multinational. And what tends to happen is that if there's some negative sentiment around just Hong Kong, like we've seen with the security law, or um, it could be potential opportunities for you to buy into Hong Kong names that, that where the fundamentals of their business are not really reliant on Hong Kong. I mean, a casing study would be someone like AIA, where yes, Hong Kong is a cash cow for them, but their growth business is in China and, and is around the opening up of the insurance market to international insurance companies in 2021. Another one would be Tektronic. Um, Tektronic, they do power tools and is a company we've been looking at for quite some time. Uh, and, it, we, and I'll touch on this a bit later in a moment, but it's a company that we bought into, into uh, in, in the post-COVID sort of uh, uh, market shakeout and we've been topping up ever since. Now, just on AIA, what I should, what I should say is that yes, whilst is, um, the, the China is a growth, the growth part of this business, um, stock's been doing okay. And, and actually is a more sort of new positive sentiment around their, their exposure into China. Um, it, it is becoming more and more well known. We are trimming into that. So I should say that whilst it was a stock that, um, that, that we've held heavily for quite some time, it is also a stock that, um, that, that we think maybe the thesis is starting to somewhat play out and the risk reward isn't quite as attractive as it was. But a stock that we do think where, where we do think the, the risk reward is attractive is Tektronic. As I said, a power tool company. Um, where the really interesting part of their business is for us, we think, is in the cordless power tools, um, which is a, you know, it's obviously a higher tech space and obviously higher margin as well. And they're really gaining market share. They, they, they've taken a jump ahead of the competition in terms of R&D around cordless power tools. If you're a builder, you'd probably prefer a cordless power tool than something with, with cords around your toes. Um, and so it's a really interesting area for them. Now, a lot of their business is in the U.S., uh, and then they've got a fair amount of business in, in developed markets like, like within Europe and in Australia. About 0.1% of their business is in Hong Kong. So it's, it's listed here in Hong Kong, but um, it, it's, it, it's not a, yeah, the fundamentals of the business are not driven by Hong Kong. So we, we, whenever we see issues around uh, sort of negative sentiment to do with like politics or, or anything to do with the Hong Kong economy, it's actually an opportunity to top up on a really good international business that just happens to be listed here. Um, so we like it because of the, the, the move into the cordless power tools. Um, as I said, the big part of their business is in the US. And of course, you'd expect there to be some fiscal support um, going through in the US to, to get the economy back on track. And that's good for the power tool industry. Um, and, and I would also say that these are an interesting example of, of the entrepreneurial spirit and the way that companies are dealing with uh, US-China relations. So Tektronix is probably a good example of how to overcome the trade conflict. And again, this just gives you an indication of just good management and, and smart management and the types of businesses you, you want to get behind. Now, they, they announced a few months ago that they're planning to, um, uh, you know, to invest even more heavily into, into Vietnam and, and uh, they're basically building a big R&D in Vietnam. Uh, but they've actually, they've, actually, they've, actually, they've actually set up manufacturing plants there already, um, but, but they are con continually continuing to commit uh, resources there. 
Now, how do you get around potential tariffs if you're, if you're potentially facing them? Well, what you do is you shift your manufacturing from China to your plant in Vietnam and you stick a made in Vietnam stamp on it and you send it to the US. That's, that's a pretty smart thing to do. Um, and that's what they do. So what, what does that mean for their Chinese plants? Well, if you're the Chinese plants are manufacturing tools that go to places like Australia and, and Europe, and it's possibly not very clear here, but this is a picture sent to me from one of our sales guys um, uh, in, in, in Australia. And it's a Ryobi box. Ryobi is a brand of the Tetronic Group. And they've changed the, the, they've changed the labeling to be from made in China to made in PRC. Now, if you ask the man on the street, what does made in PRC mean? They will not tell you that it's made in the People's Republic of China. Um, so if there's any sort of negative feeling around buying Chinese products anywhere around, putting a made in PRC stamp actually it very easily gets you gets around that mindset straight away and, and obviously no not many questions asked and, and so so what we're getting here is a company that sees this potential I say polit political issues on the horizon and they're doing different things to to, to, to try and circumnavigate that and and we like that and, and that's a, that's a, an example of where we're putting our capital so I've talked to quite a bit about some of these stocks um, you know, we've, we've got Hangzhou Hike Vision, which I've spoken about, Tetronic, uh, AIA, Galaxy, you know, all big positions in the portfolio. And, and what I think is really clear here is that if we like a stock, if it ticks our boxes, if we think we've got an edge on the fundamentals, we think that we have a more positive view on the earnings and the earnings over the next couple of years on the stock, um, if, if hopefully sentiment is, is overly negative or um, uh, they say not positive enough and there's valuation support and the risk reward stacks up, we will put capital to work and, you know, we'll, we'll put capital to work in a fairly big way because as I said at the beginning, we want each position to have a meaningful contribution to performance. On the flip side, if we don't really like something or the risk reward doesn't stack up and it doesn't tick our boxes, we don't own it regardless of the size and the benchmark. And you can see that in terms of our, our, our zero exposure to the likes of Samsung, Tencent, and Alibaba. Um, what I will say, and it's very important to point out, is that we will spend as much time and do as much work on Tencent, Ali, uh, Samsung, uh, Meituan, Reliance, and the big underweights as we would on our big overweights like Hype Vision, Greater Malta, HDFC Bank, Tektronic, and, 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 and ASML, and, and the rest. Now, these there is there is a risk, of course, that we get taken away if we get it wrong and it hurts our performance. So we absolutely need to spend a lot of time on those underweights as well as and as much time as we do on our overweight positions. But this is how the portfolio is is, is stands as it is today, and really the bottom up stock picking that we do um, pushes into the sector and country positioning. We we don't aim to be overweight IT or or say oh we want to be underweight consumers, uh, uh, consumer services um, because we, sorry, communication services um, because we don't like the industry or we do. It's just a function of bottom up stock selection. And then we really look at this just to make sure that it makes sense and that we're not take, making too many big bets that, 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 that don't really stack up. Um, so our IT exposure, as I've mentioned in previously, is very much around hardware. And it's very much around the, the semiconductor space. Um, the, the communication services underweight there is, is largely in part because we don't own uh, the, the likes of Tencent. In terms of geographical positioning, Hong Kong, as I mentioned, is our biggest uh, active weight. And, and it's really more about the economic exposure of the business um, rather than the, the listing. Um, then, and then the cash position is, is run up a bit. We've actually we've eaten into that cash a little bit recently. We've, we've topped up a few positions. So it's a little bit lower. Um, but we do continue to struggle to find ideas in, in Korea on the whole. Um, okay, we don't, Samsung is, is a stock we, we, we struggled with somewhat. There's, there's lots of parts of its business. You know, we like the memory business. We don't necessarily quite like the consumer electronics business, which is really sort of a volume play. It's, it is kind of a commodities type of uh, uh, business. And so within Korea, we prefer to have a pure memory player. And so we've gone for SK Hynix. Um, but when you go beyond the, the, that area in Korea, you're looking at the Korean banks, uh, you know, utilities companies, 
there's a lot of government involvement there's a lot, lot of regulatory risk and, and potential for value traps there so so we haven't really gone there then you look beyond that and you start looking at the consumer companies so whether it's around predominantly cosmetics and also duty free and that is heavily reliant on on, on travel and you know, there's not many people coming going through the front door at the moment in uh, you know in, in the shops in Korea particularly tourists um, and so we, we've we've been underweight there um, final point here is that we are underweight China so we were overweight 12 months ago we thought there was value in the market um, but you know the China market's done really quite well on a relative basis and we've been trimming into that strength we we feel that the the valuations in China are probably not stacking up quite as well as they used to um, and, and we're a little bit cautious that, that the market is potentially a bit too optimistic um, on the overall China uh, China story and this sort of first in first out um, of course they they are there is signs of economic activity there that's great um, but probably to think that we are you know, back to growth levels that were beyond what we were seeing uh, pre-COVID is probably a bit too far uh, you know, it's a bit too much of a stretch of the imagination so uh, we feel that the, the, there's, there's less value in, in the China market as we, start, as we sit here today so in summary, um, this is a concentrated portfolio, 25 to 35 stocks, and, and it's really driven by the bottom up approach. Uh, we, we, we don't sit here and say, oh, you know, we really think that you know, tech is a great area, or we really think that insurance is a great area. Let's find a stock that fits that view. It's, it's really about where, where are the good companies? Where, where do we have a differentiated view? Where do valuations stack up? And, and then wherever that is, we go for it. As I mentioned earlier, we're looking to make money anytime, any place, anywhere. So we're not really um, too caught up in terms of where a stock is listed with regards to whether it's in Hong Kong or China or, or Korea or, or whether it's in a consumer company or an industrial company or whatever. If we think that there's attractive risk reward, we'll go for it. Um, high conviction doesn't mean high risk and that's really a, a testament to the portfolio construction process we put in place. Uh, and, and there's some data that we talked about a bit earlier. Um, this is a high active uh, strategy, and so you'd expect high active money. You pay active fees, you get active money, but you do get active returns as well. And, uh, and one thing I should point out is that we, we believe with, our, with uh, the backing of our on the ground research team, that vast team that we've got across the region, that, that it gives us a better chance to outperform. And if you put a decent amount of capital behind what we think are the best ideas, you know, it gives you a really good chance to outperform uh, the benchmark. Now, there's no deliberate approach to style management. Um, so we're not trying to be growth, we're not trying to be value, and we're just we're going where the ideas lie. And, and that, that those style characteristics will wax and wane over time. And, and that we have data that we can show you where uh, you'll see that, 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 that the portfolio style um, has changed over time according to where we see opportunities in the market. And the final point, which is, is really from using uh, data sources from, from external vendors, you'll see that our overlap is relatively low actually against peers. It's actually relatively low um, versus other internal fidelity funds as well. I mean, just not by, by not owning the likes of, of, of Meituan, Samsung, Ali, Tencent, um, and, but at the same time owning stocks like um, uh, Hangzhou Height Vision, um, uh, and, and, and some, for example, Sun Hung Kai as well, as, for example, if by doing that, you, you, you tend to have a very differentiated portfolio versus what you see out there in the competition. And um, so our overlap is typically quite different. So that's the Fidelity Asia Fund. Um, I'd like to say, say thank you very much for your time today. Please contact us if you have any more questions on this or want to get any further information. Thank you.